Good afternoon. My name is Tim Hughes and I'm a member of the senior executive team at SpaceX. On behalf of the nearly 5,000 employees at SpaceX, we're honored and humbled to be with you here today at this historic site, Pad 39A. And we look forward to making history at this launch site once again. And to that end, it's my pleasure today to introduce Bob, Ka Bob Cabana, legendary astronaut and director of the Kennedy Space Center, and Gwen Shotwell, President and Chief Operating Officer of SpaceX. Gwen and Bob will make some brief opening remarks, and then they'd be pleased to take questions from you. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Bob Cabana. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today. It was a little less than three years ago that Gwen and Charlie Bolton and I were out here talking about turning pad 39A over to SpaceX. You know, this pad would have just sat here and rusted away in the salt air had we not had the use agreement with SpaceX to continue to enable commercial operations for our nation. This is the pad that commercial crew is going to launch from, the Falcon 9 Heavy, and tomorrow we're going to see cargo going to the International Space Station. What an awesome use of a great American asset. And i got to admit, I'm a little bit partial to Pad A. All four of my flights went off this pad. So I think this is an absolutely outstanding, exciting time for our nation, for commercial space, for space flight in general. This is absolutely the right thing to do, and uh, SpaceX is a great partner in making this happen. Gwen? Thanks, Bob. All right, we can... <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, for those of you that were here, I think it was April 15th, 2014, my first remark was uh, for one of the first few times in my life I uh, was speechless. And I'm feeling a little bit that way again today. Um, the Tomorrow's event and SpaceX being here uh, side by side with NASA uh, is extraordinary for the space industry. It's extraordinary for SpaceX, and I think it's great for the United States as well. Uh, CRS-10 should launch tomorrow morning, 10.01. Just keep in mind it's a new pad for us, vehicle, uh, and so let's, uh, we're going to try to lift off tomorrow um, and have a very exciting day, but we've got opportunities uh, in follow-on days as well. Um, but back to 39A, it's a historic pad. Um, we've taken good care of this pad during the refurbishment and the rebuild. We've saved precious things that needed to be saved. We've upgraded things to make them usable in the, uh, in the contemporary era here today. And I, I can't really, it's hard to express how excited I am to be here uh, just two and a half or so years after we got the lease. Um, being ready, standing on the precipice of, uh, of a launch here tomorrow. So thanks very much. I look forward to your questions, and uh, yeah, I'm so glad to be here. So if we could, we'll take questions to the left and the right. There are microphones on either side, and we'll start with the left, please. I'd like for you to also uh, introduce yourself by name and your album. Uh, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Ms. Shotwell. Um, this will be your first launch from here since September 1st, and going from Pad A, does that give you a psychological extra boost and um, talk about the comeback, at least locally, for getting back in flight? You know, it would have been great to have flown from 39A in our uh, return to flight, but we were ready uh, for the Iridium launch at Vandenberg sooner. Um, you know, every launch for me is a significant emotional event. There's not one launch that I feel comfortable and calm, they're already always nerve-wracking. Um, I can tell you it's an extra special launch tomorrow for sure. Maybe extra nerve-wracking in that case. Hi, Gwen, Irene, oh, sorry. We've got another one. Hi, Ken Kramer, Universe Today. My question is for Gwen. Um, you talked a little bit about a commercial crew. Can you tell us, um, give us an update on, on how you are doing with the Dragon, constructing it, building it, what milestones have you achieved? When do you expect to do the unmanned and manned test flight? And uh, what's the status of the manufacturing of the, of the uh, spacecraft? Thank you. So we're in the process of building a number of uh, the Dragon 2 spacecraft. Um, and uh, we are targeting to launch that first demonstration flight late this year uh, from this pad, actually. And there's still more work to do on the pad, by the way, to prepare for crew. Uh, we've got a crew arm to put in, and we've got some other upgrades as well. 
um, that we'll work on in between the launches that we execute here from 39A. The program is going well. It's never uh, going as fast as you want it to go, um, but we're, we're comfortable with our, with our program and we're certainly looking forward to uh, flying crew uh, on this pad and uh, just at SpaceX and the United States generally. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. Hi, I'm Irene Klotz with uh, Reuters. Hi, Gwen. Hey, Irene. Um, the, uh, can you give us a little update on the leak on the upper stage, what's leaking and what's your options for that? And also, um, for, about, for 39A, um, how much taller um, are you expecting to need to build the fixed service structure for uh, Crew Dragon? Thanks. Okay, let me take the easy one first. Uh, we've not added any height to the fixed service structure. Uh, it's, I think it's 305 feet tall. Um, we were going to add some, or we do need to add some height if we were to add vertical integration capability here for national security space launches. So that's the reason why we would go taller on, uh, on the fixed service structure. But for crew, we're good where we are. Um, and then as far as the, the, the leak, we have a, we had found a helium leak in the, uh, the, the spin system on the second stage. I believe we've found it. Um, we'll continue to work root cause today and uh, make sure we're back on track for a 1001 liftoff uh, tomorrow. Um, I think uh, we'll get, we're going to, as far as I know right now, we're going to proceed with the count and, and, and go into it. Hi, uh, Robin Simangle with the New York Observer. Um, my question is. Does SpaceX, SpaceX have an updated timeline for the first launch of the Falcon Heavy? And have you guys decided whether or not you're going to put a customer payload on that first launch? So we're going to launch Heavy this summer. Um, as soon as we get Pad 40 back up and running for single stick Falcon 9 launches, we'll move the Falcon 9 program over there and, uh, and lift off uh, Falcon Heavy over here. So we're still working through the details on that, but it, it's mid-year. It's still planned for mid-year. Um, obviously, I, I said earlier, schedules never stick the way other things do, um, but we're, we're still targeting mid-year for sure for that. But again, we need Pad 40 operational before we bring Heavy here. We've got a bunch of customers stacked up. And I don't currently have a payload on Falcon Heavy. There's a bunch of guys that want to fly. I think we're feeling like this is a mission that we really want to do ourselves, you know, kind of on our timelines uh, and, and our pace. Um, so we don't currently have a customer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Gwen, it's Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Okay. Um, a quick Red Dragon question, then I have a follow-up, if that's okay. Um, you know, here we are at 39A, which launched astronauts to the moon, and obviously with the shuttle. Looking forward, you know, you've talked about launching to Mars in 2018. I haven't heard a lot about that since. I wonder if you could uh, update us on where that stands. Yeah, so the Red, program, or Red Dragon program is really exciting. What we want to do is take uh, dragons, that we've previously flown, put them on a Falcon Heavy and send them to Mars. Really a great uh, great system to, to look forward to. We were focused on 2018, but we felt like we needed to put more resources and focus more heavily uh, on our crew program and our Falcon Heavy program. So we're looking more in the 2020 timeframe for that, basically the next Mars opportunity for Red Dragon. So you had said you're speechless about being here today, but I wonder if you could at least attempt <laughs> to put into words, you know, what this means to launch tomorrow, you know, from this pad. It means a lot to a lot of people, and uh, I wonder if you could just, you know, give us your best shot. Give us, okay. So, um, by the way, I never get nervous speaking in front of a crowd, and my heart is pounding uh, to come out here today. Not because you guys make me nervous, but because I've got a vehicle on this extraordinary pad behind me that, uh, that hopefully we're going to lift off tomorrow. Um, you know, I've been in this business for almost 30 years. I remember watching um, the lunar landing, sitting in front of a TV screen, really crappy, crappy visual. Um, the screen was all black and white and jaggedy. Um, and I remember my dad telling me at that time, this is really important uh, and you should pay attention to this. And, and I remembered that actually. And uh, have been an avid fan of space ever since, and I mean, this is probably this is probably the most exciting launch for me, actually, since it's at SpaceX, both because it's with NASA, who's been such an extraordinary partner for us in our journey here, and because of where we're launching from tomorrow. Was did that was that good? Does that work? It's pretty good. Thanks, Thanks Chris. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Brendan Byrne with WMFP and NPR. Um, can you talk about the, the landing attempt uh, of the booster, and has this become routine to you, or are you still nervous every time? You know, I get more nervous for launch than landing. <clears throat> um, launch is critical. It's for the customer. It's the primary mission. Uh, landing is really to increase our knowledge base and kind of bolster our technology for ultimately taking people to other planets. you got to be able to land and refly. Otherwise, it's a one-way trip, which we're not interested in, of course. Um, so, yeah, tomorrow's attempt, uh, launch attempt, um, take Dragon to orbit uh, and bring the booster back to landing zone one. Um, and uh, it will be the third land landing, second one, knock on wood, for, uh, for a NASA flight. So that's also very exciting, although I, I always forget about the landing part. I'm always so much more focused on Ascent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Gwen. Uh, Tim Fernholtz from Quartz. Uh, I wanted to ask about commercial crew as well in light of the GAO report yesterday on the schedule delays. Uh, in particular, I guess the engine is going to have to be redesigned for human rating. Can you talk about what specifically you'll have to do for that and how long it will take? Thank you. Yeah, so the news that came out uh, a number of weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal was not news. Um, that uh, uh, We've known about, we've, we've flown with cracks in our turbine wheel from the beginning of the Falcon 9 program. Um, there are cracks that we are qualified to fly with. We, are, we were comfortable with it um, for our uh, commercial launches. The CRS program was comfortable with it as well. However, we do want to get rid of them when we're flying crew. Um, the uh, redesign has been in works for quite some time. Um, and uh, the, the final spin on that engine design we sh will fly this year. P many missions before we put crew on top. Hi, that is Cesare with the Unica Phoenix, and I was hoping to get some additional information on reusability of second stage and also payload fairings. So second stage is harder to recover because it's going at orbital velocity. You know, the first stage isn't quite going at orbital velocity, so it's a little easier to slow down and bring back. Second stage will be harder, um, but, uh, I mean, we've learned how to bring Dragon back, which is kind of a third stage, actually. Um, so as far as recovering second stage, that will be kind of an evolution for our next, uh, our, our next launch system. Um, uh, but we're not, I, I don't think we're going to look at recovering second stage on the, on the Falcon program. And then you had a follow-up, which I forgot. Sorry. Payload fairings. Payload fairings. Yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna try to bring them back. Um, we have. I mean, we've recovered payload fairings. Um, I'm not sure any of them have survived in one piece, uh, but we do want to recover them, both to be a good steward. You want to, you know, you don't want them floating around like ships. Um, and then also because we would eventually love to re to reuse them. Uh, so you got to land them uh, not in the water. So we're working on that. Maybe this year you'll see that. We want to save everything. It's such a shame. This hardware is so expensive. We want to save everything instead of throwing it away or having it become junk. Hi, Gwen. James Dean, Florida today. Uh, you've talked a little bit about the history of the pad. To what extent do you feel like you are making history tomorrow with this being a commercial vehicle and, and obviously more commercial launches to come off this pad? Um, how significant do you think that is? that we're sort of changing the paradigm here and having a privately developed commercial vehicle uh, flying this mission, then could you just speak a little as well to, you know, long term, you expect to make history in, in more important ways, I guess, with, with these Mars missions. I mean, can you talk about what's coming down the line if, if all goes well from this path? Yeah, so I never look at what we're doing as making history. I, I really just try to focus on the mission and do a good job for our customers. So I, I don't, I don't, think about things in, in that way generally. Um, what I think it's important to note, it might be a commercial vehicle, but there's lots of government and private science on board as well. And it was originally a government pad, which you know SpaceX joined forces with and, and upgraded it. So it's, it's really a hybrid. So tomorrow's launch is a hybrid launch. We've got a government customer under a commercial launch authority, commercially developed launch vehicle, incredible amounts of science actually I'm pretty sure at the press conference the the science guys will go through it I was leafing through the the, the booklet and there's hundreds of experiments both taking up and coming down um, really cool stuff and so I guess I'd rather look at this as a partnership
kind of a, a hybrid, it's a blend, right? It's a, Falcon 9 started out and Dragon started out as a commercial, uh, excuse me, a public-private partnership with NASA, and I feel like all these launches uh, continue to be along that vein, and especially now with the use of 39A. Talk about the, the Mars activity. I could, you, you talked to Red Dragon already, but uh, for crewed missions eventually. We have not been shy about saying that uh, really the reason why SpaceX was founded, Elon founded this company, uh, was to f build space transportation systems that could ultimately take people to other planets. We've got our site on Mars um, for now. Frankly, I think destinations outside of the solar system are more exciting than Mars. Um, but, but we got Mars, um, so we'll, try, we'll get, try to get to Mars um, very quickly, actually. We are, um, we're very focused on um, accelerating that program as much as we can um, without losing sight of the important work that we're doing now uh, for NASA and our commercial and other government customers. I mean, I, I, I can't do a better speech than Elon did in Mexico, so. Hi, Ken Chang, New York Times. Uh, another question about commercial crew and GAO. Uh, the report said that NASA needed to go look for contingency plans because it was worried that both contractors were going to slip into 2019. I was wondering how confident you are that you, that you can uh, meet your 2018 schedule. Yeah, I'm confident we'll fly crew in 2018. So the response uh, to the report this morning was the hell we won't fly before 2019. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, I had a question about the future of uh, Falcon 9. I think Elon has mentioned uh, another upgrade coming down the line. I think he's called it Block 5. Um, when do you expect that to debut, and what are some of the upgrades you're going to introduce? Um, you know, what changes will we see on the vehicle when that flies? And I have a follow-up. So Block 5 is the last big spin on Falcon 9, and it's largely driven by the upgrades that we needed to make for the commercial crew program as well as national security space launch requirements. Um, there, there is a performance upgrade here as well, largely to get uh, more margins for these other, for these other uh, customers, very demanding customers. Um, so there's, there's a performance increase, um, there's some manufacturing in, uh, improvements, we've, we've addressed the turbine wheel issue um, that we talked about earlier here today on that, um, and, and probably 100 or so uh, changes uh, on that vehicle. And I think on, on this launch you're flying with the autonomous flight safety system for the first time. Um, why, why the switch from the manual system that's been in use for you know, decades and what does that offer SpaceX in terms of you know, independence from you know, the conventional range assets? Yeah, so we were told to fly this. Um, we would have done it anyhow. Uh, it makes our operations here at the range uh, much uh, more streamlined. But ultimately, the Air Force wants to um, kind of get rid of some of it, the assets that they have here uh, that are necessary for launch. Um, so they wanted, uh, um, and I believe NASA was driving it as well. Uh, it's just a much more streamlined way to launch, relying on newer technology for sure as well. Saves on O&M for the big uh, radars. We've been flying this system in shadow mode for quite many, many missions, by the way. This is not the first time we're flying it. This is the first time it's primary, which makes it yet another reason to be nervous about the flight. Yeah, hi, Glenn Bill Hart with CBS News. Actually, Mr. Clark stole my first question about the uh, flight termination system, but my follow-up was to Bob Cabana, and I was wondering when Crew Dragon starts flying with an automated uh, flight termination system, maybe what an astronaut's perspective is when there's no human being in the loop anymore uh, for S and events that, that could go bad. I'll give you my perspective, Bill, and uh, we still have to certify it for uh, crew operations. But, I mean, this is the future. This is where the range is going. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. Um, Prior to shuttle launches, we used to uh, go visit the guys that sat on console that would push the button and show them pictures of our kids and get to know them. But, you know, the truth is, uh, with a human in the loop, if you've got a, an envelope that that rocket is to m remain within as it goes out over the ocean, if it's approaching the edge of that envelope, 
you know, a human may terminate it uh, when the system is actually correcting to get back towards the center. Whereas an automated system done correctly, it can iterate fast enough that the system sees that the guidance system is taking it back before it's going to exceed that limit. So in my opinion, if done correctly, an automated system is actually safer, more reliable than having a human in the loop. But we've still got some work to do before you know, a commercial crew is going to certify uh, that this is the way to go, but this is the future. Thanks, Equin. Just a real quick follow uh, on the same question. Does this give you guys the ability to launch uh, to meet your manifest? In other words, if you don't have to have the range in the loop, does it help you in terms of how fast you can fly? Like, could you fly on the same day ULA is flying? That sort of thing. So it does streamline the operations here um, at, uh, at both ranges, actually. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, we still need the Air Force uh, and, and NASA to fly and the FAA to fly. But it does tighten timelines for sure. I think the turnover to go from a ULA launch to a SpaceX launch or, you know, um, it's mu it should be much faster. So, yeah, it would be very enormously helpful to getting things done. Jeff Faust of Space News. A uh, question on future launch manifests. I know you've talked about ramping up the flight rate to launch maybe every two weeks or so. Uh, at the same time, earlier this week, Iridium said they were pushing back their next launch from April to June because of a backlog of launches on your manifest. Can you talk about how you're going to get through that manifest over the, the next few months and, and get to that uh, launch every two weeks rate? Well, we're pretty close. We're pretty close to the two week tag right now out of the factory. Um, and uh, and out of Texas as well. So we really we just need to get flying. And then you should see hardware here about every two and a half weeks initially, going to every two or so weeks uh, after that. Um, yeah, Iridium we moved their launch out two months, um, but it was really to uh, fill in the queue of folks that are that, that have been waiting for a flight since we were down last September. Well, it's still going to launch all their missions in the contractual time period though. Scott Powers from Florida Politics. I have uh, related questions for both Bob and Gwen. I assume that uh, uh, whole generations of, uh, of engineers and technicians uh, made their careers on this pad. Uh, Gwen, I'm wondering whether or not you guys were able to hire any of them onto your staff here or, or through contractors. And Bob, I'd like you to comment if you could sort of on their behalf about uh, uh, what it means to see this pad come back to life. So we have had, uh, we have hired some folks from the, from the shuttle program. I don't know if we've hired even one that was part of building this pad, um, but, uh, but we definitely have hired people from the shuttle program. They've been great contributors to SpaceX. Specifically to, uh, to work this pad as far as uh, operations go? You know, at, at, when you're at SpaceX, you work everywhere at SpaceX. If there's a need in Texas, you go to Texas. If there's a need at 39A, you go to 39A. Um, so I can tell you 39A has had a lot of emphasis over the last three or four months to get prepared for tomorrow. So it's likely. Do you mind repeating the question one more time? I didn't quite hear. Yeah, Bob, uh, uh, obviously a, a lot of engineers and technicians spent their careers at this pad. I'm wondering if you can speak uh, sort of on their behalf of what it means to see this pad come back to life. Well, I think it, it means a lot to see the pad just not sit and, uh, and waste away. It's a tremendous asset. And uh, everybody that I've talked to is very pleased to see that uh, we're still utilizing it, that it's fulfilling a function. Uh, we want to see more launches, uh, government and commercial, off all these pads. And I, I think uh, we've got the team, the contractor civil service team, the partnership with our uh, commercial partners to uh, be able to do that. And we want to continue to make it happen. You know, I see our role as an enabler. You know, we provide the services to, uh, to SpaceX to be able to make this operation possible. And uh, it's, it's a great partnership. It's great for our nation. So we want to we continue it just like we want to do with the rest of our commercial partners. You know, you talk about young folks coming on board. You know, SpaceX, of course, has a, has a very young team. And, and they got a few old season guys that they managed to steal, too. But, you know, uh, here at KSC, We've hired an awful lot of young folks, too. I was at a, a, a training auditorium event the other day, and I asked the folks to raise their hand how many came after the last launch of the shuttle. And over a third of the folks in the auditorium raised their hand. And they are truly excited to see launches, government and commercial. And what I say is, you know, every launch that we launch off this Cape the KSC team needs to, needs to uh, take credit and be proud of that because in some way 
we supported or helped enable it. So uh, it's an exciting time for spaceflight. Uh, we have an awesome future in front of us. Bart Leahy, Spaceflight Insider. Two quick questions for Gwen. Uh, one, how soon can we expect to see all of SpaceX's launch pads in operation? And two, when do you plan to extend attach the crew access arm to 39A? So the 39, or the crew access arm has to go on by the end of the year, um, obviously to facilitate uh, our crew demonstration flight. Um, I don't have an exact date for you, but it'll be by the end of the year. And then when will we have all our sites activated? Um, Pad 40 should be back up and running uh, this summer. Um, and uh, Vandenberg's up and running, and you know, as of tomorrow, uh, although 39A is obviously already activated, we did a static fire here this past Sunday, um, but first flight uh, out of here tomorrow. Um, we have Brownsville uh, as well, um, and I think we're still doing dirt work in Brownsville, trying to build that kind of giant mountain that you see, uh, the, the ground support equipment up there for the pad, up to the pad deck. So we're still doing that in Brownsville, Texas. Rick Lansby with WFIT and NPR News. Do you have an estimate of when we might see a flight with one of the flight-proven boosters? Oh, good question. Yes. Um, yeah, we're going to fly uh, the... Uh, we should fly a flight-proven booster this March here for the SES-10 mission. Yep, out of this pad. Very exciting. It's in the... The, the booster is in the, is in the hangar. Oh, oh, no, that one's not in the hangar. It's on its way back to the hangar. It was in the hangar. Went to Texas for testing, now it's coming back. Um, Marcia Dunn, AP again for you, Gwen. Um, Boeing recently introduced its uh, Starliner suits. When can we expect to see the Dragon suits? And can you give us a little sneak preview? I never give away SpaceX secrets. Um, our spacesuits are really cool, though. They look really good. Um, we've spent a ton of time on the engineering, obviously the utility piece. But uh, we also wanted them to look really good. Like we're trying to inspire the next generation, existing generations, future generations, and and maybe even some past generation folks uh, to be thinking about the future and thinking about space travel. Um, I'm not sure, John. Do we know when we're rolling the suit out? Yeah. Don't, don't know. Don't yeah, it won't be me though. I won't be rolling that one out ahead of its time. It's great looking though. It's super exciting. Uh, it's not going to be blue, is it? It's not gonna be what? Blue. Blue? Blue color. Uh you know I've seen I've seen the suit in a bunch of different colors. Not pink. I've not seen a pink one though. Thanks again, James Ian Florida. Gwen, can you just kinda of give us a state of SpaceX uh, coming off that, that second mishap? Um, how is the company doing? Uh, uh, in the Worst case scenarios that we always worry about, if you had a, another bad day anytime soon, you know, how would that affect the company? Can you withstand that? Yeah, we can certainly withstand another bad day, although I always hate talking about it. Um, you know, we have, uh, we've got cash in the bank and we have no debt. So financially, we're fine. Um, it's hard to make money, though, in a year when you have a failure, though. So uh, I'm not going to kid anybody to say that that wasn't a painful financial year for us last year um, and, frankly, 2015. Um, but that doesn't mean we're still, it doesn't mean we're not a healthy and a vibrant company. We can withstand another failure for sure. Yep, I would not have done my job properly um, had we not been prepared for that. But people are smiling again at SpaceX after the last flight. It was a good, good, good comeback. Um, and uh, people are really enthusiastic about uh, the commercial crew program. You know, this, this flight here out of 39A, Falcon Heavy is super exciting. People are excited about Red Dragon, and they're really excited to start working on the Mars ship. We need to keep everybody focused on the other stuff first. Let's get those things done reliably, fly successfully, um, and then, then there'll be lots of activity on the Mars work. Uh, I'm Jim Siegel. I'm with the Celebration News and Space Flight Insider, and I'm a little curious about the number of launch pads or launch facilities that you have. Um, I can understand one or two, but um, so, so wh why so many? I mean, it seems, it seems like a kind of duplication of facilities. Is it because they're tailored for different payloads, or what? What's the reason? 
So the launch site at Vandenberg is tailored for high inclination launches. You, you can't really do that kind of launch from here on the East Coast. Um, and we probably would be fine with these two plus the Vandenberg site, but uh, we do like operational flexibility um, and geographic diversity as well on, at, on launch sites. Um, frankly, the fact that we were this close to operations on 39A when we had the event on September 1st last year was enormously helpful. Um, it obviously takes longer to rebuild that pad than to get this one up and running quickly. So, I mean, from a business perspective, you really want to have multiple launch sites. Um, and uh, commercial missions go rapidly. You know, my commercial customers are happy to, you know, sit on the deck as short of possible time uh, or as short as possible. Um, but many of our government customers uh, are likely to sit on the, on the launch mount uh, longer. Um, and so, you know, you, got, you don't want to back up your commercial missions while you're waiting for a National Security Space launch to go. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's the mature thing for us to do is to have launch pads. And we are getting really good at building them. Mm -hmm. Hi again. Um, Gwen, you've said that a new launch pad costs roughly $100 million. Um, was this in that ballpark, or about how much did you save by being able to take over and refurbish some of the shuttle assets? Yeah. Um, keep in mind, this is more than just a launch pad, right? There's the crew capability. There's Air Force vertical integration capability that's going to get enhanced as well. So um, I wouldn't say that we saved a bunch of money here. Is $100 million a good figure to use, or do you have a better ballpark? You know, I did not ask my finance guys uh, how much we've spent so far. Um, it might be a little, it might be less than $100 million. But I think when it's fully outfitted for crew and NSS, it'll be well over that. How's that? Okay. Thanks. Gwen, Brendan Burrow, WMFE again. Um, any hiccups you're expecting tomorrow? Do you have FAA approval to launch? Are there any range issues, weather, anything that you're, you're worried about? Um, so I was worried about an FAA launch license and weather, and both have cleared up. So uh, we, we've got to obviously address this, uh, this spin issue tonight. Um, but uh, I don't see anything between now and then. Yeah, so everybody keep everything crossed for a good flight tomorrow. Uh, hi, I just wanted to ask the, the delay or the worry on the launch license. Can you talk about why that came in so last minute? Well, for, I think we normally get our launch license from the FAA pretty, pretty close to the actual launch itself. Um, this one was more work for everybody because it's first time we're launching off of 39A, um, SpaceX launching off of 39A. Um, it's, it's not really considered a government pad anymore either. So the oversight that we have over at Pad 40 with the Air Force, we don't have here. Um, so everybody had to figure out what are the roles and responsibilities, who's doing what, make sure you check all the boxes to make sure no one gets hurt out there. Um, uh, and so it just, it, it took longer. That plus the autonomous flight safety system, that was a big challenge, getting that done. Um, we did certify that for range safety perspective, but as Bob mentioned earlier, we still have to certify that for crew. So certification work is by no means done there. Um, but the FAA has blessed it, the 45th has, as has the 30th. Hi, uh, Ken Chang from New York Times again. Uh, for the Mars ship work, when were you hoping to really start accelerating that work, and how are you looking to finance all that? <clears throat> so I think we will hit, uh, um, we need to finish the work that we're doing right now. So, you know, as we wind up commercial crew, um, as, and I don't mean wind it up as in not do it anymore, I mean wind up the development piece on that, wind up the development on Falcon Heavy, then you'll start to see a shift um, in, uh, in development teams at SpaceX. Um, but we will always have great engineers and technicians working, you know, the programs that we're working right now. A year or so is when we'll start to shift focus, is my guess. Stephen Clark from Spaceflight Now again. Um, what's the plan for the rotating service structure here? Uh, and if it's going to come down, when will we see it come down? Yeah, it's definitely coming down. It's coming down in bits and pieces. So you have to do a before and after. I think the first two floors are, are, are down. Um, what we're doing is we're um, pulling it down, actually, literally piece by piece, um, and uh, uh, NASA gets the scrap value for, for that metal. So, 
just as we as we get to it, we we, we pull more down and uh, give NASA a check. Have you seen a check yet from us? Not yet. It, it's in the mail. We get, <laughs> we get the scrap. We don't get the money from SpaceX. We have to get rid of it. Oh, you, oh, you have to get rid of it? Oh, we can sell it for you. <laughs> we we have time for one more question from this side. Ken Kramer, Universe Today, uh, Northeast Astronomy Forum. Back to Mars. Can you talk about? Uh, um, are you going to have a science payload at all on this on this first mission? I understand NASA is not going to have one now. Are you going to have a, um, industry, universities at all compete to submit proposals? Yeah, are you talking about for Red Dragon? Red Dragon, yes. Oh, um, no, we were going to fly some stuff on the 2018. We could fly more in 2020 because people are, are more ready to fly in 2020 than 2018. Um, but, uh, no, we're going to put as much um, payload on Dragon as we can. By the way, Dragon, just Dragon landing alone will be the largest mass put on the surface of, uh, of Mars. Just a Dragon alone, empty Dragon, which will be pretty crazy. Yeah, but no, we're, there's a bunch of folks that want to fly, European customers, uh, commercial guys. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be stuff in Dragon. Thank you. Plus our own stuff. That's, the last That's right. All right. Well, thanks very much for your time and attention today. We're really excited about tomorrow's launch. I think the only thing that's left to say is, Go NASA, go Falcon 9, and go CRS-10. Thank you.